and we began a brand new important series about God that I believe will contain and has contained some important and life-defining content for each and every one of us. We're calling this series, The God I Wish You Knew. The God I Wish You Knew. Because when it comes to the subject of God, right, like our belief in God or lack thereof, in a crowd this size, my guess is that we find ourselves all over the map when it comes to our faith or our belief in God. Many of you really struggle with God. You struggle with the belief that there even is a God. You struggle with, if there is a God, I don't even know if I believe he's a good God, he's a loving God. And I get that. I totally get that struggle. Maybe you feel like you look back in your life and as you think about different seasons and different ages and stages of your life, you think about, man, God has just kind of disappointed me and let me down time and time again. Matter of fact, Sean, I even prayed to God a few times. And to be honest, I really don't feel like my prayers got any higher than the ceiling. Some of you wonder how God could be loving, and yet at the same time, how he could allow tragedy and pain and war, sexism, rape, violence, racism, all throughout our world. So you've just kind of got this laundry list of questions about God. And like I said last week, if we were to sit down over a cup of coffee or the legal addictive stimulant of your choice, and we were to talk about some of these things, and you were to tell me, Sean, I really just don't know if I believe in God. Or Sean, I flat out don't believe in God. I'd say, tell me about this God you don't believe in. And chances are, after you were done describing this God you don't believe in, chances are I might say something like, Yeah, that God that you just described, the one you don't believe in, I don't believe in him either. And then I'd say, let me tell you about the God I wish you knew. And that's really what this series is all about, helping you to discover the God I wish you knew. And I really hope that throughout this series you experience him in different and new ways and that you actually listen and focus in and take some of the things that you're learning here and really process through those things. And as a result, you come to see God in new and different ways. Ways you've never seen him before, maybe never thought you could see him before. That's our prayer for you during this series. That you might actually take some real steps toward a faith in God. So today I want to talk and walk you through a story of the Bible that's all about how God really does walk with you and me through the different periods of our lives, through the devastating lows and the amazing highs and everywhere in between, and how through it all, he transforms us, he changes us. This is a really cool story. It's about a guy named Joseph who very early on in his life, like as a teenager, he got a super clear, a vivid picture of what some future point in time in his life was actually going to be like. God allowed him to see this. So grab a Bible if you've got one with you, or maybe the app that you use, and come with me to the first book of the Bible. It's called Genesis. It actually means beginnings. We're going to be in chapter 37 to start, and then we're going to move around a little bit. If you don't have a Bible yet, you can follow along on the screen like always, but do me a favor. If you don't have a Bible or you don't have one that doesn't sound like it was written by Shakespeare, grab one at the Welcome Center on the way out today. We've got these blue Bibles out there. They're free. You don't have to pay anything. We're not going to call you and charge you late fees. It's yours to keep. No strings. Grab one on your way out. So we're going to, like I said, we're going to move through these chapters kind of quickly this morning, but here's what I want to encourage you to do, all right? We're going to have a little bit of time this afternoon, some of us, because the Brownies aren't playing today. They took care of business on Thursday night. Go Baker. Yeah, right? And the Steelers aren't playing today either. They have yet to show up for the season. No, the Steelers are playing later tonight. But what I want to encourage you to do is I want to encourage you to sit down at some point this afternoon. And I want you to read through this story that we're going to walk through a little bit today. I want you to read through it in one sitting. Starts in Genesis 37, kind of wraps up in Genesis 47. Ten chapters, they're not that long. Sit down and read this story in one or two sittings, okay? Because this story really highlights, it does an amazing job of highlighting how the God I wish you knew really does and can lead us to the places we need to be, but how he's way more interested in shaping us into the right kind of people. That's what he's way more interested in. See, God... God cares way more about who we are than where we go and what we do. And there's this powerful imagery throughout the Bible 
that kind of portrays or likens God to an artist or a potter shaping our lives on a potter's wheel as, as we're the clay. How God loves to put us on that potter's wheel and, and shape, mold, create, chisel, and kind of work out any major flaws, these character defects, these things that cause distance between himself and us and, and ourselves and other people. And he loves to put our hand, his hands on our lives. He loves to transform us into the kind of people he knows that we can become. And he did that same thing in Joseph's life as well. So we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. It says Jacob, it might say Israel in the version you're using, it's the same guy, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age. And he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said, all right, guys, listen. Listen to this dream I had. So we're all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat, right? All of a sudden, my bundle stood straight up, and your bundle circled around it and bowed down to mine. His brother said, so you're going to rule us. You're going to boss us around. And they hated him more than ever because of his dreams and the way he talked. Now, we see here in the beginning that Joseph is daddy's favorite, okay? Like, when Jacob talks about Joseph, he probably gets all starry-eyed and excited, right? Joseph always got the last piece of chicken. He always got the biggest brownie. He always had his friends over, okay? That's the situation we're talking about here. He'd been given special treatment. And his father, Jacob, even went so far as to give Joseph this amazing Technicolor dream coat thing, all right? And this was way more than just like a crazy, right, early age uh, fashion statement. This was a long, ornate robe that was all about status. When you wore that robe, it meant that you did not have to do manual labor. You didn't have to get your hands dirty. And typically, the older brother got to wear this robe. And along with it, got the exemption from manual labor. But Jacob gives it to Joseph, one of the youngest of the brothers. So this kind of throws Joseph's special treatment by daddy right in the faces of his brothers. Right? All the other kids are getting their clothes off the bargain rack at Dollar General. And Joseph's sporting a brand new trench coat from Saks Fifth Avenue. Okay? This is how it, how it was for them. Now the fact that Joseph was daddy's favorite, that really wasn't his fault. Right? Not the best parenting technique in the world, but you can kind of see why the Bible tells us that his brothers, at least early on, why they couldn't stand him, right? Do you notice any kind of glaring character defect in Joseph that God might want to kind of shape or work out of him? I mean, you can imagine kind of walking into the family room one day and saying, excuse me, guys, yeah, guys, I got an announcement I'd like to make. I got a word from God. I did, right? Me, right? Now, I don't have all the details yet. But this much is totally clear. Everybody in this family is going to serve me, right? Actually, one day, you're all going to actually physically bow down to me. This, of course, goes over like barbecue at a bar mitzvah for all the older brothers, right? And yeah, God gave Joseph this dream, but how cocky, how full of yourself do you have to be to share it like that? Now, Joseph's dreams of God, they come true. These things happen. By 30 years old, Joseph is put in charge by the most powerful man in all of, in all of the earth at that, that time, as far as we know, the Pharaoh of Egypt. But not before Joseph would undergo a major transformation. Because again, God's will for our lives is much more about who we are than it is about what we do or where we go. Now, maybe you've experienced, like I have, that experiencing and understanding God's plan for your life can kind of be like a crazy roller coaster ride. I mean, it really can. Sometimes you hear that still, small voice of God, like the Holy Spirit just leads you and says, hey, this is where I'm leading you. This is where I need you to go. And it just seems so clear. But then in the next breath, you hear him say, and please, fasten your seatbelt, keep your arms and legs in, grab hold of the bar in front of you, and enjoy the ride, right? Right? That's exactly what's going on with Joseph here. From age 17 to age 30, those 13 years, those are completely filled with some wild, hang-on-for-your-life, roller coaster ride 
type of things. Now, there are many times during those 13 years of Joseph's life where it would have been completely possible, maybe even likely, for Joseph to lose sight of the hope that that God even cared about him, much less that God had something bigger in mind for his life. Ever have one of those days? Ever have one of those weeks? Ever have one of those months? Those lives? So Joseph's brothers, they hate him. And they're out, and they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're out in these fields of Shechem, and they're, they're taking sheep in a new pasture to graze, right? And they're tending these, these sheep, and all of a sudden, Jacob, daddy, sends Joseph, little brother, out to take the big boys some supplies and to check on them and report back. And they see Joseph, the brothers see Joseph coming up over the hill, and he's wearing his dad likes me better than you coat. And they're not happy, right? They're not excited to see this kid to see their younger brother Joseph. And their resentment, their jealousy, their rage just begins to kind of churn up in their hearts. I mean, in Genesis 37, verse 18, they say to each other, here comes that dreamer. I got it. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these old cisterns. We can say that a vicious animal got him. That's what we'll tell dad. We'll see what his dreams amount to. Some of you think you've got sibling rivalry going on at your house. Verse 21, Reuben heard the other brothers talking and intervened to save Joseph. We're not going to kill him. No murder. Go ahead and throw him into the cistern out here in the wild, but don't hurt him. See, Reuben planned to go back later and get him out and take him back to his father. Now, the reason, real quick, that Reuben kind of stepped in and intervened in that way is because Reuben was the oldest and he would be the one that would have to give an account of Joseph back to dad. So he's kind of watching his own back. Verse 23, when Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was dry, there wasn't any water in it. So now Joseph's literally standing at the bottom of a deep pit, looking up. Ever have one of those days? So the brothers sit down. They eat their supper. And off in the distance, they see this this caravan coming, this caravan of gypsies coming. And one of the older brothers named Judah, he just starts seeing dollar signs, right? And he's like, I got an idea. We could totally sell him. We can sell Joseph. You ever wanted to sell one of your younger brothers or sisters? Been there, right? We could totally sell him to these gypsies passing by. Then we'll take his fancy coat, we'll go ahead and throw some goat's blood on it, we'll take it to dad and we'll tell him Joe got snatched up by a mountain lion or something. So that's what they do. They sell Joseph to the human traffickers of their day. These gypsies, these traffickers, they take him to Egypt where he's auctioned off. He gets picked up by a guy named Potiphar who just happens to be the head of security for Pharaoh. And what happens is this guy Potiphar, he takes Joseph home and puts him to work. So Joseph's not in Kansas anymore, right? He's not daddy's favorite anymore. He's not the golden boy anymore. And, and this dream, these visions he got from God, and these things really aren't working out the way he thought they would. And you wonder how many times at the beginning of this journey he thought to himself, man, if I just, if I just wouldn't have been so prideful. I just wouldn't have been so cocky. But the interesting thing is that the scriptures tell us over and over and over again throughout Joseph's life, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. See, God was interested in using whatever came Joseph's way to mold and to shape Joseph. And as Joseph worked as a slave in Potiphar's house, he learned an amazing trait that every person who wants to grow in their faith, who wants to grow in their relationship to God, every man or woman who wants to grow in their faith in God must learn this. The priceless trait of humility. He learned humility. And as a result, God continued to work on him and transform his life and use his life. And Joseph became the kind of person that no matter where he was or what he was doing, Even if he was a slave in an Egyptian household, he served and loved with character and integrity. 
Look what the Bible says happens as a result. Genesis 39, verse 2. His master Potiphar recognized that God was with him, saw that God was working for good in everything he did. He became very fond of Joseph and made him his personal aid. He put him in charge of all his personal affairs, turning everything over to him. So Joseph's doing his thing with character, and he's being used and shaped by God. Things weren't exactly the way they were back home with dad. They never would be again. But you know what? This isn't really so bad. This isn't really so bad until Potiphar's wife shows up on the scene. Some of you may know the story. She's got a thing for Joseph, right? She's a cougar, okay? Genesis 39, Genesis 39 describes Joseph's physical appearance. It says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. All right, so the scriptures tell us. He's, he's handsome, he's ripped, he's a hottie, okay? Joseph's just a hottie. And I, I look at the, looked up the ancient Hebrew word for handsome, and it literally means balding with a little gut. <laughs> literally. That's what it means. Maybe not. <laughs> anyway, Mrs. Potiphar, some of you guys are like, see, I told you. Mrs. Potiphar, she starts coming around, right? And she strides in. She's got on her tight jeans and her clear heels. And she's just shaking it like a Polaroid picture, right? And she doesn't mince words. The only thing she says in the story, come to bed with me. She has to be the most, like, blunt come online ever, right? I mean, literally, the Hebrew says sex now. Over and over again to Joseph. But because God is doing so many good things in his heart, and God really has a handle on Joseph's life, he doesn't give in. Genesis 39 verse 8 says he wouldn't do it. He said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master doesn't give a second thought to anything that goes on here. He's put me in charge of everything he owns. He treats me as an equal. The only thing he hasn't turned over to me is you. And you're his wife, after all. How could I violate his trust and sin against God? Well, she doesn't like that answer. She doesn't like that answer. So one day, everybody else is gone in the house except for she and Joseph. And she goes to work again. And she backs him into a corner and demands that he sleep with her. She grabs up close and grabs his shirt, grabs his coat. And Joseph literally pulls away and runs out of the house so fast that his shirt and his coat come off. And she's just standing there holding this shirt and this coat that used to hold this young, good-looking guy in it, and he's gone. And, of course, she gets hurt. She's embarrassed. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. So she just starts screaming about this slave that just tried to sexually assault her. Well, then hubby, Potiphar, he comes home, and she tells him this big melodramatic story. And all of a sudden, he takes Joseph and has him thrown in prison for attempted rape. Ever have one of those days? Where you're just kind of trying to do the right thing, trying to do the honorable thing, and the next thing you know, you're literally, you're looking through the prison bars of accusation, false accusation. Now, I'm sure if there was a time when Joseph kind of hanged his head and was just frustrated and questioning and doubting that after all that and being thrown into prison after being faithful, that that had to be the time. That had to be the time where he goes, yeah, this is great, God. This is just great. I really love the way you work. Great plan. Wonderful master plan. Yeah, that part where I got beat down by my brothers and sold into slavery, awesome. Just awesome. And that trip through the desert, chained up with those stinky gypsies, would love to rebook that cruise. That was great. And being sold as a slave into Potiphar's house. Rape charges because I tried to do the right thing, the honoring thing for you. Yeah, God, this is exactly how I imagined my life turning out. Ever have one of those days? But you know what the scripture says right here again? God was with him. God was with him right there in prison. 
God was with him. Question, how would your outlook and attitude in life be different if you really believed that God was with you? Genesis 39, 19, but there in jail, God was still with Joseph. He reached out in kindness to him. He put him on good terms with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. He ended up managing the whole operation. The head jailer gave Joseph free reign, never even checked on him, because God was with him. Whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. See, in spite of the circumstances, God had Joseph on that potter's wheel and was transforming him into this capable and now humble man. And Joseph became one of those guys who could just, he could just roll wherever he was tossed. And they made him like inmate number one. He was like a trustee over the whole place. And after several years in prison, Pharaoh tosses a couple of his servants in along with Joseph, a butler and a baker. These two guys get tossed into prison. The Bible doesn't tell us why they're there. Maybe the bagels were stale or there were like spots on the royal glasses or something. But Pharaoh throws these guys in the slammer and both of them end up having dreams that they can't figure out. And they go to Joseph and basically ask, hey man, do you know anything about dreams? Joseph's like, do I? Come on. Shoot, give me your dreams. What do you got? And they tell Joseph their dreams. And Joseph, through the power of God, is able to interpret the dream. He says to the butler, he says, hey man, your dream means that within three days, you're going to be out of here. You're going to be released. And God will restore you to your original position as butler, what the scripture calls cupbearer to Pharaoh. To the baker, on the other hand, he says, man, your dream means within three days, Pharaoh's going to take off your head, impale you on a pole, and the birds are going to pick your bones clean. And then Joseph says to the butler, one thing, I'm not really supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. Like, I've been kidnapped, I've been set up, I've been framed. So when you get your job back at the palace, the name's Joseph. Can you remember to put in a good word for Joseph? Well, everything happens exactly as Joseph said it would, but look at what the scripture happens with the butler or the cupbearer, as he's referred to in the scriptures. The guy that promised Joseph he would name drop him in front of Pharaoh. Genesis 40, verse 23, but the head cupbearer never gave Joseph another thought. He forgot all about him. He forgot all about Joseph. Ever have one of those days? And the scripture says, Genesis 41.1, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. So Joseph literally waits in prison two more full years until finally Pharaoh has a couple of dreams. And Pharaoh's all stressed out about it. He's called in magicians. He's called in his wise advisors from across the nation. Nobody can tell him what these dreams mean. Just then the memory of the butler kicks in. And he says, your majesty, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a guy, right? I got a guy. And let me just stop there. Let me just say this. Thirteen years have gone by since Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Thirteen years. Not thirteen minutes. Not thirteen days. Thirteen years have gone by. And I'm thinking every one of those days, Joseph had the same opportunity that you and I have to completely lose sight of the fact that there is a God who loves us and has a plan, has a will for our lives. And maybe you feel like you're kind of in the middle of one of those 13-year plans right now, right? Let me just remind you that the Lord sees the whole picture. He sees the whole canvas. And what you're currently experiencing, what you're currently seeing right now, is just kind of a few brush strokes that fit lovingly into this plan that God is painting for your life. But I need to make this disclaimer. This is important. God's plan doesn't necessarily look like the American dream. And you need to know that. Because we have the tendency, what we do is we have a tendency to let our American culture paint a picture for us 
of what this life really looks like. And then we take that canvas, we set it up before God, and we say, see that right there? If that's what following you looks like, I'm in, right? I'm totally down with following you, God, as long as it includes granite countertops and pillow top mattresses, right? I will let you lead my life. And somewhere along the way, God says, excuse me? You call that letting me lead your life? You call that trusting me for a future and a hope? See, my plan is to transform you. And I will use whatever I need to to shape and to mold you into the person I want you to be. One of the core things I've learned from reading the story of Joseph over and over again throughout the years and living life is that God is far more interested in my character than he is in my comfort. Hands down. Until we step onto the train of that truth, we're just going to keep on taking that same canvas to God and saying, it's got to look like this, and then I'll follow. And God says, no. No, it doesn't. I'll use whatever this life throws at you to shape you and to mold you into the person I know you can be. And I will lead you to where you need to be. And you can trust that and you can trust in me. That's the God I wish you knew. Let me give you the other principle that kind of just jumps off the pages in this story. God is always with you. God is always with you. See, what Joseph could have done easily at any point along the journey is he could have stopped trusting in God and started trusting in himself very easily. But he realized something. Joseph realized that God was just as much in the pit as he was in the prison and he was in the palace. Matter of fact, the, the pit and the prison were the means to the palace. And I think almost the whole time, Joseph was remembering that God was with him, working in the darkness. So you need to know this. When it gets dark, God doesn't go to bed. God doesn't go to bed. God doesn't sleep. God doesn't take naps. God doesn't need a double espresso to wake him up in the morning or a Red Bull to keep him going in the afternoon, all right? When we exhaust our bodies... And we crash into bed at night. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. God is up all night moving, working, and stirring. God was always at work. Always at work within and walking with Joseph through everything. Day after day after day. The at work in the dark. God was waiting for Joseph's life to get to the right moment. The exact precise time. When Pharaoh has a couple of dreams, and no one can interpret them. And you can read the rest of this amazing story for yourself. But in one 24-hour day, God would move Joseph from the prison to the palace to the second most powerful position in the entire nation. God has not abandoned you. You need to know that. Because some of you are there. That's what you feel like. God has not forgotten about you. He's working behind the scenes of whatever dungeon, whatever prison you feel like you're in right now. He's committed to working all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And you can trust him. He is working for you and with you and through you. Not for your comfort. Not necessarily for where you're going to go but to shape you into who you need to be because he loves you. That's the God I wish you knew. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you how every story throughout the entire scripture, God, whether it's the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, and the Torah, God, and the, the prophets, and the law, all the way up through the New Testament, every story is about, ultimately, points to, and is about your son, Jesus. And that God, even through this story of Joseph, we can see parallel the life of Jesus. 
That just like Joseph was taken and sent to a people in a place so far from home, so was Jesus as he was sent here to live and breathe and walk and teach among us. Just as Joseph was abused and beaten and taken advantage of and falsely accused and persecuted, so was Jesus. And God, as I pray, so many of us would would read and come to see later in the story, just as Joseph had all this happen to him to prepare the way for his brothers who were just evil in their hearts and tried to kill him to come home and to get forgiveness and provision. You sent your son to be beaten and falsely accused so that those who did it, our sins, our shame, our brokenness that hung him on that cross, that we would be forgiven and we would be restored and we would no longer be enemies. God, thank you for that truth. Thank you that the gospel is reflected in every story across every page of scripture. I pray that the people in this room right now would come to understand two things. Number one, that you are a God who loves them. No questions asked. There's nothing they could do to make you love them more. There's nothing they could ever do to make you love them less. And number two, you love them so much you sent your son. And he came and he lived and he died and he rose from death so that we might be able to be with you for eternity and have a new life and a new purpose now. I pray those of us who know that would be constantly reminded of that and live out of that identity day after day after day after day. And I pray that those who don't know that would taste and see that it's true and that there is a hope and a future that is so much more beautiful and amazing than they could have ever asked or hoped for. That's my prayer for our people this day. It's in Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen.